This is Jeffrey Sachs, editor of Tradition. You're listening to an installment of an engaging series of conversations about issues facing modern Orthodox Judaism around the world. Your host for these conversations is Rabbi Alon Meltzer of Congregation Or Chadash in Sydney, Australia, talking with authors from Tradition's recent Rabbi Norman Lamb Memorial Volume. Visit traditiononline.org to order that volume, sample open access chapters, or subscribe to our Journal of Orthodox Jewish Thought. This series is produced by Or Chadash in cooperation with Tradition. Our thanks to Rabbi Meltzer for his leadership on this initiative. Here's the conversation. Rabbi Meltzer, um, I am the Rabbi of Orchadash Synagogue here in Sydney, Australia. Um, I am really excited to welcome you to the second series, sorry, the second um, talk in our series, Modern Orthodoxy, which is a collaboration between Orchadash uh, and Tradition, the uh, Journal of Jewish Thought, uh, commemorating or looking at the uh, incredible edition uh, in memorial of in memory of Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb. Um, before I begin and introduce uh, Dr. Rana Novik, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand here uh, in Sydney. For those of you who are not uh, <coughs> are not uh, from Australia, we have a, a custom to acknowledge the indigenous peoples on whose land uh, we reside. So I acknowledge the um, Vigigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, as I said, we're really excited to be able to join together with tradition uh, and uh, to hear from eight scholars from around the world over the course of this winter series. Tonight, we have Dr. Rana Novik, uh, the Dean of Azrieli uh, Graduate School of Jewish Education and, and Administration at Yeshiva University. Um, Dr. Novik is recognized for her expertise in behavior management and child behavior therapy. She is a published author in uh, many journals and um, in different places. And uh, tonight she's gonna to be sharing uh, her thoughts, her, uh, her sort of scholarship on Dr. Lamb's uh, position around education, around the impactful education and creating a, sort of an emotional connection with with education. Um, we are extremely delighted to have you, Dr. Novik, and I want to pass it straight over to you so that we can begin tonight's uh, class. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for having me, and good evening, everyone. I had the good fortune to be asked by the, the um, editors of the volume to review the three chapters in Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb's 70 Faces of Faith, on Jewish education. And that's the chapter that I have in the tradition volume. And what I wanna to do today, I'm gonna to share my screen in just one moment. What I wanna to do today is to think about Dr. Lamb's work and his views, but I also wanna think about the challenge, the opportunity and the obligation of Jewish education, both that follows directly from his thoughts and from the facts on the ground today. So um, we'll consider these three essays. I want to um, move today throughout both the academic and theoretical ideas of Dr. Lamb, as well as his practical applications, and those when he was writing, which was in the 70s, and now, many years later, and in the midst of a global pandemic. I have the, the un, I sit in a unique position of being able to share the view from 20, 10,000 feet and the view from what I would call almost on the ground because as the Dean of the largest preparer of Jewish educators in North America, the Azraeli Graduate School, I interact on a daily basis with students who themselves are already teaching or who, alumni who um, are teaching as well as the schools in which they work. So that's my almost on the ground. I'm not the classroom teacher. I'm not the, uh, the nuts and bolts, but I'm hearing about it from those that are in the trenches. I'm gonna focus today primarily on K through 12 day school education while I recognize the much broader spectrum of the field. One of the magical things about Jewish education 
is that Jewish learning has broken the bounds of the classroom and is happening literally everywhere, in offices, in camps, in shuls, as well as in traditional day schools. My background and my bias, I am by training and uh, by profession, a clinical psychologist. I'm particularly interested in how children learn, but also in how they grow fully as individuals with behavioral challenges, with emotional challenges, and with spiritual challenges. And that's the what I brought um, in reading Rabbi Dr. Lamb's brilliant uh, work. But I sit at a school of education, and so I have always had a bias towards schools as very important agents of change and growth in children's lives. And I have always believed that Jewish or secular schools can be places of enormous health promotion and growth, or they can be toxic in children's lives. And obviously we want them to be the former. I talked about what Jewish education looks like today. And this is just one slide that gives you a, a little view of the many faces and flavors of Jewish education from the traditional to the experiential from young children through to uh, senior citizens and adults. We are speaking at a time when we have, when we have had um, horrific losses in the past year or two. Uh, Rabbi Dr. Lamb's thinking is nothing short of brilliant when he tells us that Judaism is an intellectually based religion and the single most important theme is that of study. But that is that that dry academic view is coupled by his other statement, which is that Jewish education endeavors to produce first young men and women who will live their personal lives in a Jewish manner. It's not talking about just study and participate fully in the affairs and concerns of the Jewish community locally and throughout the world. Second and even more fundamental, it seeks to secure in them an inner sense of identity as Jews, the transformation of the student's personality from something Jewishly unformed to something Jewishly informed, what he calls its Judaization. Rabbi Dr. Lamb in his brilliance understood education cannot be only of the book. Education needs to be education for life. Our other great loss, a wonderful thinker, a mover, a, 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 a force in the Jewish world, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs also spoke eloquently about the role of Jewish education. When he said, to defend a country, you need an army, but to defend an idea, you need a school. Judaism is the religion of the book, not the sword. And throughout the centuries, when the vast majority of Europe was illiterate, Jews maintained an educational infrastructure as their highest priority. It is no exaggeration to say that this lay at the heart of the Jewish ability to survive catastrophe, negotiate change, and flourish in difficult circumstances. We miss those, certainly miss those voices in our world. Rabbi Lamb's focus in his three articles were the goals and the aims of Jewish education, the challenges and the boons that impact Jewish education from the cultural and societal trends of the day, and finally, the roles and responsibilities of Jewish educators. And so I want to unpack each of these three areas and again, look at what was Rabbi Lamb's thinking and what are the realities that we are dealing with and how can we take Rabbi's, Rabbi Lamb's call to action uh, seriously and apply it in today's world? So let's start with what Rabbi Lamb identifies as goals and aims of Jewish education. He talks about what's the tachlet? What is the, I don't know how you translate tachlis. What is, it's not just the essence, it's what's, 
what's the business? What's the important drive of Jewish education? <clears throat> it's teaching for not today's outcomes, but for tomorrow's, for lasting outcomes. And the two areas of lasting outcomes that Dr. Lamb identifies is a commitment to Jewish action that as we read in the earlier quote, that Jewish young people, Jewish students will graduate from their Jewish learning, <clears throat> ready to not only live Jewishly, but to engage in the, all of the mechanisms of Jewish affairs on the local and the global level. The commitment to Jewish action though has to be paired with this sense of Jewish identity, with seeing themselves firmly and strongly as Jews. And you can see where these two outcomes not only go together, but drive a lasting impact on a student and their learning. I wanna talk about three aims of Jewish education that Rabbi Lamb discusses in his papers. Continuity, axiology, and mitzvot. Continuity is not the way we think of continuity. Today, typically when we think of continuity, we think, will the Jewish people continue? We think of Jewish peoplehood. Will people stay part of the tribe? Will they marry in? Uh, will they continue to lead Jewish lives? The goal of Jewish education, Rabbi Lamb argues, is continuity of Jewish education, that it will inculcate in students a lifelong passion for and habit of text study, of Torah study. And he says that the elementary schools have to teach basic skills, especially Hebrew literacy, so that students can access texts. And elementary schools have to teach a love of learning. Secondary schools get to teach ideas. And uh, idea, um, I'm, I'm missing a word there, and idea difficulties. So when ideas or challenges or conflict arises. And he saw the college level where he served in leadership for so many years and so ably as critical in forging the habit of lifelong Torah learning. And I will just say as an aside that a doctoral dissertation done at Asriyeli ex exploring what happens to students who even after a day school experience, even after um, a year or two learning in Israel for their what we call their gap years, when they return to a college that is purely secular versus when they return to a college like Yeshiva University or Toro College or another faith-based institution that embeds Jewish learning, the long-term outcome is massively different and that there's a much greater lifelong learning um, sense. And yes, that I will share the slides with anyone who wants them afterwards, um, that, that there will be um, a much better chance of lifelong learning for those students who attend a faith-based institution that interweaves Torah learning as part of their study. Axiology is Rabbi Lamb's um, term for the relative value we assign to Torah learning. A goal of Jewish education is that we come out as graduates assigning an extremely high value to Torah learning, that we see it as central to our existence, to the next generation's existence, et cetera. But none of this is, is sufficient without the lived learning the Torah living that comes through doing and living the mitzvot. So again, I wanna unpack this a little bit and say, given that this is what Rabbi Lamb wants out of Jewish education, what, what do we do? How are our schools doing this? Are they doing it well or not? And what are the challenges and opportunities that we face? We have, a constant tension, a dialectic between content versus affective outcomes. And what I mean by that is, how many pasukim do you know? How many tefillot can you say, by heart, 
can you say with facility versus I felt a sense of connection to God, to Torah, to Jewish history. Very, very often our schools get bogged down with content. And part of this comes, parents are paying a lot of money. They are sacrificing often quite a lot in order to have their children in a day school. They want their third grader to be able to stand next to them and, and daven the amida. They want to be at their Seder table and hear their child say not only the four questions, but all the divrei Torah, all the words of explanation that they've learned at school. Is it, will it be sufficient? Will they accept a child coming home and say, I only learned a little bit of the Haggadah, but it's so interesting and I really loved it. And I can't wait for my Pesach Seder. Unless and until we give schools and teachers the permission to go lighter on the content and to pay attention to those affective, spiritual, personal outcomes, we, I, I worry that we are going to have a generation of literate but disconnected Jews. Knowing how to read Hebrew, knowing how to, to dissect a pasuk or a perush, a commentary or a, a words of Torah, it's not enough if it doesn't touch our heart and our soul. And we need to think about in our schools how we balance, because the research also says, if I can't read Hebrew by third grade, the outcome is quite poor for my ability to crack the code of Jewish text and to have access to the rich Jewish canon of text and commentary that is written almost exclusively uh, in Hebrew and in other ancient languages. The second challenge we face is that we're going to talk more when we talk about the role of educators. We need passionate, compassionate, skilled, authentic educators. And I was speaking to Ravalon before about the shortage of educators uh, that you face in Australia, and that is uh, likely to continue or expand. It's not an Australian problem. It's a worldwide problem. And by the way, it's not only a Jewish education problem. In the 1970s, 40% of all college students chose education as their major. I'm sorry, in the 1940s through 60s, 40%. Starting in the 70s, it began to decline. It's now down to 4%. Only 4% of college students are majoring in education. For 22 years, there has been a steady decline in the number of graduates from education programs, at least across North America, and I suspect the entire world is the same. So we have to think about what is going to, and I'll talk about this more later, what is going to attract and keep the right people teaching the future Jewish leaders of the world. Finally, we have an enormous challenge, um, but also a boon. Lifelong learning is now widely accessible. You can learn anywhere, anytime. I live in a commuter community. There are shiurim on the train. There are classes. They know, take the third car, goes a Gemara class, and the second car, pi car Pirkei Avot. There's learning happening in businesses at Lunch and Learns. There's learning happening at Starbucks and at coffee houses. There is learning happening online. We learned all too well in the past two years that we may not be able to be in the same room, but we can benefit from learning the same text. There is so much that's available. At the same time, there are very real economic demands on individuals and families. Workdays have expanded. Finding a job, a parnasa, a, a way to make a living that supports a family has become, at least I see in many young people, pa of paramount concern. And it often pushes aside the idea of taking an extra year to learn, the idea even of choosing a career that would allow me to learn um, in a more significant way. 
The next area that Rabbi Lamb addresses is cultural factors. And I have to tell you, it's a little bit eerie to read something written in the 70s that has such prescient relevance today. Really makes you think that he, I know it's, it's, it's you know, our religion doesn't have crystal balls, but it does make you think about how prophetic he was or how um, universal some of his ideas were that they apply to almost any time. And he dealt with two factors, primarily the economics of career choice and the impact of revolutionary and counter-cultural movements in the late 60s and early 70s. I've said this already. I've also mentioned uh, these this data. Um, Jewish education, however, in particular, suffers from two negative but accurate perceptions. And I know this because I speak to undergraduates. I speak to people considering the field. I speak to rabbinic students and I speak to educators and those who hire them. And the perceptions, and we've done surveys uh, as well. So we have hard data on this. Um, but people believe that a career in Jewish education offers limited financial reward. And I have to say that that is largely true for example, in the New York metropolitan area where I'm located, the starting salary for Jewish educators working full time is not horrible. And it compares to starting salaries in many other careers. The problem is there's no place to go from that starting salary. Unless a Jewish educator moves into administration or has what they call their, their side gig, they have other jobs their earning power doesn't grow no matter how many years they've been in the system. But another really critical component has nothing to do or little to do with money. And that's the respect, the limited respect that Jewish, Jewish educators receive. Rabbi Lamb in his writing talks about that horrible precept, those who can do and those who can't teach. That is so incorrect. It should be that those who can do and those who care teach. Jewish educators are um, underpaid, underrespected. I think I have this on a slide. One second. No, I don't. Um, they're they're underpaid. They're underrespected. They're underrecognized, and often they're unrewarded. It's you know how often. Many Jewish educators live in the communities in which they work. How often are they stopped when they're doing their pre-Shabbat shopping and thanked for the work they're doing versus how often are they stopped to hear that their test was too hard, that they're giving too much homework or that they're not treating somebody's child in the right way. Rabbi Lamb wrote that this is part of a larger problem that he called assimilationism. And he says, as long as we consider the entire Jewish enterprise as irrelevant, teachers are superfluous. Jewish education is not valued because we don't value anything. We all want to just be Australians or Americans or like everybody else. Dr. Erica Brown reminds us, and I heard she's going to be one of your speakers and aren't you fortunate for that. Uh, teachers are what will make a difference in learners' lives, and we don't have enough people choosing the sacred profession of Jewish education. Why? We don't do enough to honor those who've already chosen education professionally, unless we celebrate Jewish educators for the extraordinary professionals they are. Who will want this career? And I see this over and over and over again. Not only will I not get paid, but I won't be paid enormously well. I won't get rich as a rabbi, but at least I'll get some kabod. I'll get some respect. But if I'm just, I hate that word, just an educator, what do I have? I have neither the respect nor the funds. In thinking about the other issue, culture and counterculture, and remember, he's writing in 70s and 80s, Rabbi Lamb reminds us that revolutionary youth is, is not a new, I'm sorry for that typo there, it's not a new challenge. 
Rav Cook was dealing in the 1920s with the challenge of the religious, Zionists, and secular pioneers. If you go back even farther, Rav Shem Shoner Farl Hirsch was writing about revolutionary youth. And probably one of my favorite, all time favorite books is the Piazetzner Rebbe's Chovas HaTalmidim. It's a book that's a guide to the student, but the first 20 pages are guides to parents, is a guide for parents and educators. If you haven't read it, it's probably, I think, some of the most important 20 pages ever written on Jewish education. The Piazetzner Rebbe was writing in the Warsaw Ghetto, the time of the, the Shoah. And he was writing about the fact that people say youth today can't be taught, youth today have no attention span. Sound familiar? Because we're still saying it. We're just saying it about different youth. Youth today don't respect their teachers. They don't sit and learn the way we did when we were young. And the Piazetzner Rebbe writes, and I, I'm paraphrasing, you have to read his beautiful language, either in the original or in the English translation. But he writes so beautifully, basically, woe to us if we blame the students. It is on us, the parents and the educators, to recognize that it is our chiyuv, our responsibility in every generation to teach the way they need to be taught. We need to make an adjustment, not blame them if they are not learning. We need to find the way to show them, he says, that they have within them the ability to be Eitze Chaim, to be trees of life in Hashem's garden. So it's not new. We've seen it all along. And Rabbi Lamb says, sympathetic listeners who can accept the current generation's criticism, their current generation's thinking, will have their message of their generation, of their Torah, meet receptive ears. If we can be non-defensive, now this is, a, this is a delicate line because the Torah is the Torah. It's unchangeable. We can't say, well, you know, let's take some white out and we'll, we'll change those words that make us uncomfortable. But if we can say, despite the discomfort, we believe the Torah has your discomfort. We believe the Torah is saying an important message here. We, we're not going to throw out our traditions and our, our mitzvot, our commandments, because they're not popular. Rabbi Lam also argues that a countercultural atmosphere, a, a world where every thought can be challenged, allows existing beliefs to be unraveled and leaves room for Jewish education to move in and say, here's a worldview that perhaps has meaning in today's crazy world. Here is a way of living and thinking and learning that brings value to human life and um, light unto the nations and to our world. Now, there's a really important last point on this slide. Rabbi Lamb wrote, and again, he's writing 79 to 85, as Western civilization in the form we have known it approaches its moment of truth, what we have to say, if we say it articulately and honestly, may get us a better hearing. So what are the implications of this? Well, Again, it's prescient. He was writing about the civil rights movement. We are living right now with the Black Lives Matter movement. Rabbi Lamb's thesis posited that the success of the African-American cause and the celebration of black culture, very different from prevailing views of assimilation. We have to be a melting pot. Everyone in America has to cede their culture to the American ideal. But the, the rising of the Black Lives Matter and in his time, the civil rights movement, he argued bodes well for Jewish culture. And he wrote, if the black man can succeed, then Judaism will prosper that much more because it will mean that practicing Jews will be accepted for themselves as themselves without having to apologize for their existence. We may agree or disagree with his sentiments here, certainly, in the United States, acts of anti-Semitism are 
way on the rise. And there is no sense yet that um, the Black Lives Matter movement is in any way uh, decreasing the levels of anti-Semitism. Rather, what I think is, is the, um, the, the shared cause is the Black Lives Matter movement is largely a response to, at least in the US, the radical right movement, which is um, not a friend to Black culture and to African Americans. And that radical right culture is also often a, a safe, give safe haven, not always, but often to anti-Semitism. So I think their, their, their responses uh, to the same cause. Rabbi Lamb's final uh, caution or, or sense that we can get a better hearing because of Western civilization approaching its moment of truth, I think rings incredibly true and powerful at this point in time. There is a lot going on in our world. And teenagers in particular and young adults are, are keenly aware of what is happening in civilization. And they're watching our response. They are watching the Jewish response. They are looking, what are Jewish leaders and Jewish institutions going to do when just this week there was a horrible mass shooting in an African-American community in Buffalo, New York. What is going to be the Jewish response? Is it going to be, as is consistent with Torah values, care and concern for all human beings, not only for the loss of Jewish life? If we do it right, then the younger generation sees us as, and, and they see Torah living and Torah values as valuable and important in the world. If we fail them, if they see hypocrisy, when they see people with yarmulkes committing a crime, engaging in fraud, engaging in bad behavior, in Israel, the Chaim Walder phenomena rocked the religious world. When we see people who espouse Torah values on one hand, and live in a degenerate, non menschlich way on the other, we lose the ability to be impactful. What can we do in a concrete way? We need teachers and curricula that are comfortable and consistent with, lever uh, comfortable, consistent with, or leverage current worldviews. We can't only be teaching ancient history. We need to be teaching when we're teaching al tamod al dam reyecha, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. We need to be thinking and teaching about it, including in our curriculum. What does that mean today in today's world? What does it mean as Ukrainian Jews are suffering? What is our obligation? What does it look like to not stand idly by? We need teachers and curricula comfortable with difficult questions and possibly even with letting questions stand and not providing all the answers. Even sharing our own personal philosophic and religious spiritual dilemmas. To say, someone asked me um, this at a workshop recently, how do you answer why God is making this happen? And, uh, and I, I said, my personal coming to terms with a global pandemic, a war in the Ukraine, with mass shootings in the US, with increased anti-Semitism, is that I, I have to recognize the minuscule view of the world that I have and of the arc of human history and say, thank God, literally, it's above my pay grade. I don't know what all this means. I don't know where it's leading, but I trust that God does. I put my faith in God to move the world in the way that it needs to be moved. And I don't, I don't pretend to understand it. There are times that I hate it, that I rail against it, but that's how I come to terms with it. 
it went, if I were dealing with adolescents or young adults, I would say, I don't know that that's how you'll come to terms with it. Each one of us has to find our own way to put together our belief in God, our Torah views, and what we see happening in the world. We also need role modeling. We need to recognize the importance of authentic observance. We need to realize that 24-7, 365 days of the year, we are being watched. And it's not just, your children are not, children are not just watching their own parents. When they're in synagogue for services, they're watching everybody. And if on a weekday morning service, they're seeing that people are pocket texting while they are trying to talk to God in heaven, how authentic do they think your Judaism is? And how do they see the value of prayer? If they see that while you're engaged in your Torah learning, which you're doing on Zoom, you have four other windows open and you're texting and emailing and looking on Facebook and buying something on Amazon, how can they value Torah learning? How can they think that you value it? And if you tell them, I want you to go learn for a year in Israel, but that's how your learning looks, then we're hypocrites. We have to live the life that shows the next generation that this is, this is authentic, this is important, and this is valued. The final area, and perhaps the most salient and most important and the one we can do most with, uh, are the roles and responsibilities of the Jewish educator. And Rabbi Lamb wrote so eloquently about this. Um, and I had the good fortune to begin my time at Yeshiva University when he was still there, although it might have been, he might no longer have been president, um, but I had some opportunity to interact with him and he has family that are neighbors of mine. And so I had opportunity to see him. Um, and uh, he was a very dignified gentleman, but he really had the soul, the wisdom and the humor of an educator. He talks about not only what effective educators teach, but how they teach and the identity that they bring to the classroom. And by identity, he means what teachers believe and who they are, how they live their lives. In terms of content areas, and he has other writings about it, but in the chapters, in the volume that I was writing about he talks specifically about Israel education and about Masim Tovim. In terms of Israel education, he says, not only is it critical, but it's been insufficiently exploited. We haven't done enough of it and we haven't leveraged it to build students' connection to their Jewish identity. And he also goes on to say that we have to connect Holocaust and the state of Israel in our educational endeavors. As, as I quote here, in order for young people to understand in the depths of their being that Israel is something ineffably vital to them. I, I have to say that as the world increases in its anti-Semitism and its negativity, there are times that I very palpably feel the safety that comes from knowing I have a country. I have a place. It's a complicated place. It is both easy and difficult to love. It is financially challenging to visit and live there. And yet, I know that if I need it, it will be there for me. And that is a connection that Rabbi Dr. Lamb so wants us to inculcate in today's students who, thanks thanks to, uh, at least in the US, the gap year is almost a given. Over 80% of the graduates of modern Orthodox Jewish day schools do a gap year, many do too. In some schools, it's 99% or 100% do a gap year. Their, their experience of Israel is wondrous and wonderful, but have we made the connection 
that this country is theirs. I will never forget the first trip we took our children to Israel was the bar mitzvah of our eldest son. Um, and he happens to be a pretty, at the time, was a pretty shy child who would in America never go up to the counter at the pizza store and ask for napkins. He would be very reluctant. He would say, you know, Ima, you go do it. We get to Israel and, and he would also not walk in the streets of New York far ahead of us. He would be next to us and stay nearby. We're in Israel a week. We're there for maybe a week. And we notice that he's walking, you know, way ahead of us on the street. We go to Pizza Hut or whatever Jewish pizza place, there, a kosher pizza place there is, Big Apple Pizza. And we need napkins. He goes up to the counter. And in Hebrew, he says, Mapiot bevakasha. And, and I turned to him and I said, you know, you're different here. You do things here that you don't do at home. What is different? And he looked at me like I was a, an idiot. And he said, Ima, look around. Everything's in Hebrew. This is my country. This is a 13-year-old. A 13-year-old resonated with the fact that here I can be me. I'm not worried about wearing a yarmulke. This is who I am. Obviously, it's more complicated, and a 13-year-old doesn't see the horrific impact of terrorism and the price that we pay for it being our own. Finally, Rabbi Lamb talks about Masim Tovim, social justice. It's the essence of Jewish learning and Jewish living. And he says it, it can't be simply as, yes, the whole world now is all rainbows and unicorns. We have to take care of each other. We have to give. We have to be generous. The whole field of, of positive psychology emphasizes gratitude and generosity. He says that's wonderful. But we have to identify for our students in Jewish education that Chazal says the Torah bespeaks generosity and kindness from beginning to end. This is not a psychological trait. This is a Torah midah. This is a requirement. This is a mitzvah. This is a commandment that shapes who we are as Jewish people, not because it's good for us psychologically, our mental well-being. That's an after effect. After effect. It shapes us because it's part of Torah living. Um, Rabbi Lamb's passionate plea about what educators need to do and who they need to be. It's extraordinary. He says, we in Jewish education have to rid ourselves of our rationalistic prejudices and liberate ourselves of our own self-images as intellectual, misunderstood philosophers, frustrated professors. We must see ourselves again as whole human beings, as sentient beings who must speak and communicate with students not only by skills and techniques, and not only through ideas, but through real, genuine experience and emotion. We must kindle the spark of Jewish feeling in ourselves. We've got to add more drama, not dramatics. There's got to be more dvekut, more heart, and less inhibition and bashfulness in demonstration to our students of our own capacity for religious experience. He goes on to talk about, we have to sing Zmirot. Educators, find your voice and sing with joy and with abandon. Not that I know all the lyrics, but sing in a way that shows that your heart's in it, that your soul is in it. We have to bring the feeling of Jewish life, our feeling of Jewish life, to the forefront. Um, Rav Zinger, in the yeshiva Makor Chaim in Israel has a program called Lifnai Lifnim that works on students' self awareness and spirituality. It's being um, done in several schools in the US as well. And what I find magical about the program is before students engage with text and with exploring their own life and their own feelings through text, Jewish text, Torah text. Educators in training do it first. There's nothing that is done in the Lifnei Vilifnim workshops with the students that hasn't already been done with the group of educators that are leading these workshops for the students. And so when students talk about what number am I today? 
how spiritual am I feeling? What, as I look at this text, what is, what else is flooding my mind that I need to park outside the door so that I can really be here and be in this learning? The educators have done the exact same exercise in their own sessions. We need to look at our own spirituality as educators and our kind of take stock and get back in touch with what brought us to teaching in the first place. He goes on to say, Rabbi Lamb, that the Jewish educator has to be a mission-driven, devoted teacher. But beyond what she knows as a scholar and what he knows as a talented pedagogue, pedagogue, the Jewish educator must be, his words, a complete Jew, a complete human being, a mensch. We really need more menschlichkeit educators. When we think about the teaching reality, what are Jewish educators experiencing, novice educators and beyond, in the blue box is what I hear when I interview young and not so young people who are coming to the Azraeli Graduate School, either to become educators or to up their game as educators, to increase their skill, their knowledge, um, and uh, perhaps their passion. In every single instance when I do the interviews, I meet self-sacrificing individuals who have an abiding belief that this is a sacred mission. They're doing this not to teach Torah specifically, but to impact the hearts, the souls, and minds through being a Torah Jew, to give the gift of Torah to the next generation. And they are driven to want to give back and to make a difference. That's where they start. That's what they come to the field with. And then they're in the field for a while and they discover these are all the uns. These are the seedy undersides of Jewish education. They're underpaid, they're underappreciated. They may feel unrewarded. This year, I, I'm hearing from everyone, I don't know what the experience is in Australia, but every teacher in school that I come in contact with this year tells me the same thing. I'm teaching eighth graders. It's as if they're sixth graders in the room. I'm teaching high school seniors. It's as if they're in year 10. I'm teaching second graders. It's as if they're in kindergarten. Two years. Every single teacher in school I see talks about a two-year lag. And they're not talking about a cognitive lag. Yes, there are some skills that are lagging but they're talking about attention span, behavior problems, aggression, stress, depression, anxiety. Front page of the New York Times has had a series over the past few weeks on my students are not okay. That's the headline. My students are not okay, but the high levels of depression and anxiety. The teachers are feeling that as, as much as I was prepared, I was poorly prepared. And they're leaving the field because there are opportunities and better opportunities elsewhere. They see this is dead end. Either I go into administration, which perhaps I don't want to do or I'm not suited for, or I have to have a, another career on the side. But you know what? So-and-so offered me a job in retail or in, in finance, and I could do that. I could sell real estate and I'll make twice what I'm making as a teacher and have better hours. So what do we do? What is our, oops, sorry. What's our communal responsibility? Sorry, I'm clicking the wrong thing. I need to move my, I need to move things out of the way and it doesn't wanna move. Well, what's our communal responsibility and obligation? We really have to think about how do we cultivate the resources to grow and to nourish Jewish educators. You know, we, we did an amazing program at Azraeli called Mafteach for key, but it also happens to spell in English, Maf teach at the end, Teach is teach at the end. We take college juniors and seniors. We match them with a school in a community far from New York. And we send them off during the break of the yeshiva, but when schools are in session, we send them off for a week to 10 days 
and for two other weekends to live as part of that school community, to sit in a classroom, to give some lectures, to be part of the ruach of the school and to learn about Jewish education. The first year we had 12 undergraduates participate. At the end of the program, three decided to go into Jewish education as a field that had not thought about it before. In the second year, we had 14 participants and we had five choose to go into Jewish education. And three of those five who had not chosen it before, three of those five now say, I don't think I wanna stay in my hometown. I think I wanna to go to one of these out of town satellites and teach elsewhere. But it takes time and energy to have programs that expose young people to the richness that is possible in Jewish education, not the financial richness, but the rich opportunities for making a difference. We need to elevate the kavod that is due Jewish educators. How do we do that? Uh, I know one pulpit rabbi who makes it a point to stand. He sits on the bima. He stands when an educator walks into shul. He says they deserve kavod. I, I would love to see a, an initiative where we have Jewish education Shabbat across the world, where we ask every Jewish educator to stand in shul and we applaud them and we thank them. Maybe we send them Shabbat dinner that week. We take care of them, um, but that's not all we need to do. We need to celebrate the successes of Jewish education. Sometimes we have a teacher doing miraculous things in a corner of, of Sydney, Australia, or in Cape Town, or in New York, or in Chicago, or in Los Angeles, or in um, South Florida. Only their school knows about it. We need a vehicle to celebrate the wondrous things that Jewish education and Jewish educators are doing. And we need to give Jewish educators in some ways broader reach than their own classrooms. But more important than anything, we need not to despair. We need to be hopeful. We need to look and work towards what can be, what the possibilities of Jewish education offer us. And quite frankly, they're endless. Again, my job is amazing. I get to see the innovations of a group called Pedagogy of Partnership and, and programs in civic education and the, the best in, in Hebrew teaching and the best in values teaching and the wedding of positive psychology and Torah in classes on Pirkei Avod and on the Jewish holidays. I, I get to see wondrous things, but I, I worry that not everybody knows all of the things that are happening and all the things that could be if we put our huge, the Jewish community has huge both human and financial resources but too often they're going places other than into Jewish education. Rabbi Lamb gives us words of chizuk. And with this, I'll, I'll end and I'll open to questions. The covenant between God and Israel guarantees the eternal existence of the Jewish people. So it all boils down to faith. Faith in the surpassing endurance of the sacred legacy we are commissioned to pass on. Faith in the ultimate success of the enterprise of Jewish education, faith that despite all difficulties, we are determined that we shall not be defeated, that we shall counter pessimism with persistence, that the covenant continues, that Am Yisrael Chai, because Od Avinu Chai, and that therefore the Torah is a Torah Chayim. Thank you so much. I've given you my contact information. I'll just do my, my one minute, you know, little sales pitch here. The Azraeli Graduate School offers all of our courses on the master's level, fully online and asynchronously. No time difference, Australians. You can do the work whenever you like. We welcome educators from around the world, whether you are, are our students or opt to just audit or join one class or several classes. Um, I, if you email me, I can give you information. Um, and 
and uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk with people who are interested in a degree, in a course, in any way that we can uh, support educators in their growth. We also have, you know, do consultation with schools and with individuals. Um, so let me respond to some of the comments and questions. A content and emotion do not have to be in conflict. Where they become in conflict is when either administration or parents get so focused on what students know and, and the what I call the Viter phenomena, you know, Viter, Viter. We have to do another pasuk. We have to get through. We have to make a seum. We have to finish. And quite frankly, one of the challenges I see curricularly in Jewish education is that while it might be much more impactful to teach by theme, we are people of the book and we tend to teach by safer. Our tradition is, you know, you learn a book, you make a seum. It's not like, okay, I'm going to learn everything written in, in Tanakh about Ben Adam Lechavero. I'm going to read all of the writings about business ethics, and I'll make a seum on that. We make a seum on completing a sefer. So our tradition comes with kind of an inherent push to finish content, as well as the year comes with a push. You know, by Rosh Hashanah, I want to get over my Rosh Hashanah curriculum. I want you to know what Yom Kippur is by Yom Kippur. Oh, the Sukkot break is coming up. Well, I have to teach you about Lulav and Etro. We have this inherent push to get through content. We have to give, I do not think they are mutually exclusive. And I think content can be taught in a way that it, it does include emotion, but you may teach in, as a result, one or two pasukim less. And somebody has to tell you that's okay, or at least not make you crazy that, you know, but the other third grade did the whole Haggadah. We have to be a little bit more chill because if you know the Shema by heart, but you're never going to say it again in your life after you leave day school, what's the point? If you carry the Shema in your heart, always, because you learned it with such deep meaning and passion, then it's yours. You own it and it will be with you forever. Um, the, what does Rabbi Lamb mean by a complete Jew? Aren't we all Jews in progress, so to speak? 100%. We are all a work in progress. None of us are perfect. And Rabbi Lamb, one of, I think, the most humble men I've ever met in a leadership position would be the first to admit that. Um, but I think what he meant by a complete Jew is a Jew who is not only a, a, a head, but also an action Jew, that we're not simply cognitively learned, but that we're living what we learn, that it, 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 comes from the page into our life and that we do it. Um, and also he was very big about Meshkite, that you know you have to do it, not just because it says so, but do it because it's the, it feels like the right thing to do. And it's part of, um, part of uh, wow, thank you. Um, joining from Riverdale, New York so early this morning. Wow, I thought I'm the only one getting up this early. <laughs> Any other comments or questions. Thank you all for joining me, whether it's your evening or your morning. It really is a pleasure to talk about something I'm so passionate about and about the writings of, of a man who was equally passionate and much wiser than me. Dr. Navik, on behalf of uh, Ochadash Synagogue and on behalf of the Australian community, I want to thank you. Uh, you might know this already, but Australia is in many ways an experimental laboratory. Um, and this community at the moment is grappling, perhaps a little more urgently than it has in the past, with the challenge of how to nurture a viable and sustainable and effective education structure, education system. And many of those online tonight are deeply engaged in that challenge. Um, a significant part of the problem, as I know you know, is defining and articulating the issues. And what I've loved about this session, and I'm sure everybody else has too, is that it's been a brilliant articulation of those issues. Not only an elegant distillation of Rabbi Lamb's thought, but a fabulous reframing in your own words in the context of today and the challenge that we face around the world. Um, I'm sure that many of us will be able to draw on what you said tonight um, in our endeavors in the immediate and, and near future. So thank you again very much. 
My pleasure. And, and any way that, that from across the world, we can collaborate. And if you're the laboratory, then let us learn from your, um, your good choices and your errors. Um, it, it is, I, I have to say, I, I told uh, Rabbi that I was on the phone with South Africa. I was on Zoom with South Africa yesterday. This is not an Australian problem. It is not a North American problem. This is a worldwide problem. And in a world where we pay people who make widgets more than people who grow people, there is something inherently problematic. Um, you know, there is nothing more precious to me than my children and my grandchildren and the people who care for them and spend m almost more time with them than I do should, should be, if not extraordinarily well paid, then at least seen as the heroes that they are. Thank you very much. Um, and thank to everybody you. who's online, just a plug, um, please, thank you for joining us and please continue to join us as the series continues. Next week, we have Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs, the editor of Tradition, talking about extremism, another of the challenges of the current era. Rabbi Alon, back to you. Thank you so much, Jackie, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Novick. Um, really a pleasure to have everyone for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you next week.